So there's a this top. There's my child. Too much sugar. Ryan, tell those people in there that we're sorry. Okay, so there's a few announcements because this is almost the last time you get to hear me uh, for the day. Um, so, oh, no, you can hear me anytime. I do have business cards here if anybody, I've had many people ask, well, who are you anyway? And why would people hire you to go speak at different conferences? And they do. I know, it's crazy. I just got back from New Zealand. I spoke to the New Zealand skeptics. Yes, there is a New Zealand skeptics. And there's a European skeptic congress that meets every two years. And I will be one of the speakers in Poland this September. Yeah, I go to the Czech Republic and they're going to hear all about what I do, which is the Gorilla Skeptics on Wikipedia. We are trying to change the world. Thank you very much. And in all languages. So I have heard from several people. There are so many people here who are new who have not really heard of this thing called skepticism and that we're a community, that, we're, that we have conferences, we have books, we have magazines. We, they're just like, wow, you know, whoa. And I want you to know, yes, we are a like-minded group. We are very friendly. We want to know you. And that is why I started Monterey County Skeptics in 2007, is that I didn't have anybody to talk to about this kind of thing. I mean, you could read the magazines. That's great. But we didn't have the internet. Like, we, you know, we didn't have Facebook and things like that. We just, you wanted a conversation. You read the back in the comments section of the, of the magazine. That was about all you got. So um, I wanted to be able to speak to people who didn't, uh, you know, who I could, didn't have to look over my shoulder and go, you know, talk more quietly, you know. I wanted to be in a group where I could talk and be, and be interested in science and science education and these paranormal things that are so bizarre that I wish were actually kind of real in a way. But anyway, so I want you to know that we are meeting again on Wednesday at every second Wednesday at Lopez Restaurant. It's informal completely. We have a meetup, meetup.com. Oh, now you're not taking pictures now that I've posed. But on meetup.com, uh, we have a, a Facebook group. Also, HAMBA, the Humanist Association, has a meetup. And they, they have a little mini lecture once a month. The dates change. I put it on the flyer, but I, I said check it, meetup. Well, check me up because the dates do change from time to time. And um, we are going to go over to Blaze Pizza. I've had way too much sugar. Uh, I think I'm going to have another piece in a minute, though. Anyway, but because um, the calories don't count, right? Right? Not, not at conferences. So we're going to go over to Blaze Pizza, and we're going to continue talking over there. And uh, please reach out to me uh, if you have any questions. And as Ben said earlier, Please reach out to him if you have any need to want, you want to be more involved in the skeptic community and you want to write something or want to know about research, please, we are your resources. If you want to do activism, see me, that's my thing. Um, if you want to become involved with Monterey County Skeptics or um, HAMPA, please let us know. If you'd like to be a speaker next year, please let us know. Be involved. We need volunteers. We need people. This is, we're doing this just because we enjoy it. We love it. Um, obviously, we're not making any money off of it. So, um, the last housekeeping things are that uh, we have still food left. I do not want to take any of this home. So, if you want to go and you know get a sandwich for tomorrow, please do so. Uh, take bananas, chips, anything sugary, make it go away because um, it will go home with me, and then I just can't have that. Please, no, no. And so. Um, uh, if you want to linger after the meeting, please do so because we have some things trash to put away. And I have a ton of stuff i got to put in my car. And I would love to have somebody help me put it in my car because my feet are starting to hurt. So, lastly, not last, this is he's, he's the warm-up act for Ben Radford's keynote speak uh, that is going to go for an hour. Not Leonard, but... Uh, uh, an hour? No, no. <laughs> um, uh, Ben's going to go for an hour and he's going to talk about uh, some of his favorite cases and some other things that I... and fake news. Okay, so this is Leonard Trammell. Leonard Trammell is someone I met several years ago, just hanging around skeptic events. I didn't know anything about him. He's up in the Bay Area, Menlo Park, uh, Palo Alto. And I found, soon found out that he's a lot more interesting than he looks. 
Jay, his very dear friend, said he was going to bring some frozen tomatoes for his talk tonight. Did you, did you forget or you have it with you? I'm in the car. Okay. Well, that doesn't help any. I think our lease agreement doesn't allow the ring for produce or anything. So, anyway, he's, he's a dear friend. He has a PhD from Columbia University. Apparently, they let anybody in. Um, and psychics, I mean physics. <laughs> This means Leonard is a, is officially, he can do physics. And I know this is true because I saw it happen. I went to his house on New Year's Day. His, his lovely wife invited me for some strange reason. And we saw him do physics at his house. You know, walking upstairs, putting things down on tables. You know, the, the, that amazing things that I have video of. And uh, you can all trust me because I'm standing at the podium. I have a microphone. So, you know, argument from authority. <coughs> He's a former vice president of Atari. And after retirement, he now serves on the board of directors at Center for Inquiry and is on the CSI Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, Executive Council. I know that's a lot of la la la, but uh, let me just say that the, the Center for Inquiry um, is probably the biggest organization worldwide that is focused on scientific skepticism, and that's what the magazine is on. And uh, Leonard here is the boss of everybody pretty much on uh, on of every basis of power in this room. It is not me, it is probably Leonard. Um, so I must be very nice to him. His first pet was a Dalmatian, the dog, named Jiggy. So Dalmatians are actually people too. So I don't know how many people would get that. Um, Leonard was speaking on our need for skepticism. Hey, here's your microphone. Or that that's the right answer, which is always fun. So, I'm going to put a sentence up. I'm going to ask you to read it. Uh, I'm going to read it along with you. Finished files are the results of years of scientific study combined with the experience of many years. So, how many F's are there in that sentence? All right, so, raise your hand if you think there are two. Raise your hand if you think there are three. Raise your hand if you think there are four. Raise your hand if you think there are five. Raise your hand if you think there are six. Raise your hand if you think there are seven. How about eight? All right. So this, pretty close. This is the distribution that has been done in hundreds of these tests. And the majority of people here said three. There were six. You missed the three O's. <laughs> right. Finished files, and it's the uh, um, the F in scientific. So this, all of us have seen optical illusions before. So how many black dots are in this image? <laughs> And when you look at them, they disappear. Stop the movie. Stop the movie. And the mo most amazing thing about this movie is it knows what you're looking at, which is a pretty clever movie. So there are 12 of them. Um, they are here, 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 and along that line, and along this line. So. I'd like you to think about optical illusions in a new way. There are aspects of our visual system that make us more or less sensitive to certain kinds of images that appear in our visual field. These biases cause us to see things in a way different than they actually are. These are called optical illusions. By analogy, there are aspects of our cognitive systems that make us more or less able to correctly process certain information. These biases cause us to come to conclusions that aren't warranted by the information that we're given. These are called cognitive delusions. Some things seem to fall into both categories. I'm not sure how to characterize this painting. It's a really trippy thing by Salvador Dali. Um, is this a cognitive illusion or an optical illusion? Probably some of both. Is this two faces? Is it two people? Is it three people? Anyone see a third person? 
Yeah, so there's a, a woman here and a woman here. A man, a man here. There's so there's a, there's a guy here playing a, a, a guitar or a man. And this is his hair and an ear, or this is another woman. And, and of course, you may or may not have noticed the vase and the goblet in the middle. Uh, trippy, trippy picture. Too much pain. When you say that, <laughs> what most people say, it seems like <coughs> that's the first impression. For which? Any, any of these questions. How many, how many Fs? How much, you know, how much does... Oh, no. No, it isn't, it isn't the first impression. Right, but, okay, it, if, if so let, let, let me keep going. Right. So, um, our thinking ability, like most of our abilities, is the result of evolutionary pressures. We can think well enough to survive in the environments in which we spent most of our evolutionary history, which is very different than the environment we live in today. Uh, there's a well-established model of human thought um, portrayed in a great book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. I cannot recommend this book too strongly. If you haven't read it, well, don't leave now, but get the book. Uh, pick it up on the way home. Uh, there are these things, bookstores, you may have heard of them. Uh, download it tonight, but really, read the book. It's great. Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. The basic idea is that we have two classes of cognitive systems in our brain. System one and system two, brilliantly named. Um, system one is fast, autom um, automatic, has extremely high capacity, is nearly effortless, and beyond our conscious control, and often even beyond our awareness. System two is slow, very limited, takes lots of effort, and is explicitly conscious. An important thing to realize is that system one and system two grow by learning. System one is not limited to instinct. In fact, most of the skills that are incorporated into system one, when we get good at them, at some level, this is what we mean by getting good at something. Uh, when we've mastered something, or in a common phrase that I absolutely detest, when things have been committed to muscle memory. No, muscles do not have memory. <laughs> um, another important item is the fact that virtually everything we do, nearly all of our cognition, is done by a system one. And this may explain an interesting experience that I think most of us have, have had. Um, I lived at home for the first few years of college, and I would drive home, and my mom would ask me, how was the drive? And occasionally, I would have no idea. I got home. I remember leaving school. But I had no recollection of what had happened along the way. Has this happened, something similar happened to anybody? Yeah. So how? How can you drive the car, stop at stoplights, avoid accidents, turn when you need to, and not know that you did it? And it's because system one, which you have no conscious control or often access to, is all you need to handle, call it rote things. And after a couple of years of driving to the same place, every day this becomes rote. <coughs> so this group probably has lots of examples of ways in which we think poorly. Uh, but let's go through the ones I've, I've picked up. You have no idea of, of any ways in which we think poorly? <laughs> what was your answer to the Bowman back question? Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. You see, if you had asked me that question, my response would have been, let me think about it for a minute. <coughs> you know, rather than just, you know, 10 cents. Right, so that's it. Well, there's a difference between um, your initial response and your considered but the, response. But, but the, no, so let, 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 me, let me continue. So, we'll, we'll talk about it later. So this is a lovely graphic um, that's available up, up on Wikipedia called the Cognitive Bias Codex. It divides things into four groups, um, which you might be able to read. Um, the need to act fast, not enough meaning, too much information, and what should we remember? And then it gets divided further down. There's a list of just sh short of 200 of these cognitive biases. And of course, this is neither a complete nor an authoritative list. 
but I'm going to go through a few of them. The illusory truth effect. This is a tendency to believe information that is true after repeated exposure. I like to call this an argument by repeated assertion. This effect was named and defined in a study in 1977 where a group of standard psychology subjects, otherwise known as college students, were shown lists of plausible statements, some true, some false, and asked to judge their confidence that these statements were true. Statements like, baseball became an Olympic sport in 1925. Sounds reasonable, I have no idea it's true. And I deliberately didn't look it up. These statements, regardless of whether they were true or false, were repeated. When they were repeated, the confidence people had in their truth was proportional to the amount of repetition they got. Most disturbingly, this has been demonstrated even for statements that were at the start of the study known by the subjects to be false. Uh, that particular study was done with statements like, the sari is the name of the garment worn by a uh, Scottish gentleman. <laughs> now, most people know that's wrong. If you hear that over and over and over again, you start to wonder maybe that's what they call it sometimes. This effect has been known since antiquity. Uh, I'm trying to remember which it was and it's fallen out of my head. One of the uh, uh, Roman um, authors said that the most important part of rhetoric is repetition. And it's been used masterfully in a variety of situations. And examples range from people use only 10% of their brain to Eskimos have 70 words for snow. Or, as you may remember from this morning, Hillary Clinton can't be trusted. Another is the base rate fallacy. If we are presented with both general information and specific information, we will tend to ignore the general in favor of the specific. Sorry, the specific. For example, a sobriety checkpoint is set up in a population where one in a thousand people is over the limit. It uses a breathalyzer that has a 5% false positive rate, but is perfect at detecting actual over the limit people. If someone is tested and sets off the breathalyzer, what is the probability that they are actually over the limit? Depends how many people actually are over the limit. I just told you, one, one in a thousand. Two percent. One in a thousand are, is over the limit, um, but there's a five percent false positive rate. They're probably so, not over the limit. So, what, what's the probability? Five. Can you repeat the, the final part of the question, though? Probability what? What is the probability that someone that measures that is uh, seen to be over the limit by the machine is actually over the over the limit? Two percent. So, you say a hundred percent? Twenty. Five percent. Hands. Five, 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 back there, 20. 20. So the average answer is 95. The actual answer is a little under two. <laughs> and I'm not gonna go through the derivation of it, but it's, it's not too hard. Yeah. Um, something called the suffix fallacy. When a list of items is heard, people are very good at remembering the final list item. However, if the list is followed by an irrelevant term, the suffix, recall of the final item is significantly reduced. But the suffix has to be perceived as speech in order for it to have an effect. If the suffix is a pure tone, it has no effect. So it has nothing to do with what you're hearing, it has to do with the way you're thinking. And it's bizarre that the brain works that way. The congruence bias. Um, here's an example. I'm thinking of three numbers that follow a rule. I want you to figure out my rule. You give me three numbers and I'll tell you if they follow my rule. When you are confident, tell me the rule I'm following. My numbers are two, four, six. Who wants to play? It doesn't already know. You don't know which rule I'm thinking of. <laughs> no, you don't. Because I, I wasn't sure which one I was going to use. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> in, increasing by two. 
I need another set of numbers. No, no, no. You're just supposed to give me a set of numbers, and I'll tell you. And then when you're oh. confident. Oh, uh, oh give you three more. Give me three more. So two, four, six, eight, nine, uh, eight, ten, twelve. That follows my rule. Eighteen, twenty, twenty-two. That follows my rule. You know what my rule is? Even numbers. Yeah, two. two. Incorrect. Two, one, two, one, nine, thirteen. Ten. Um, 10, 16, 26. Ten. That follows my rule. Um, what is, are, you, are you confident you know what my rule is? Yeah, what is my rule? You're taking a number like 2, adding it, well, with 2, 4, and then you're adding 4 and 2 for 6, and then 6 and 4 for 10, 10 and 6 for 16, 10 and 16 for 26. Brilliant. Incorrect. Yeah. Um, in the back, Susan. 1,027, 1,967,000. Oh. That follows my rule. What is my rule? The numbers get larger. The numbers get bigger. <laughs> That's it. Now, Excuse me? Exactly your point, right? What? Nobody tries That's right. So, so the, the important thing is, there are two important things. One is when you guessed what my rule was, Increase by two. When you asked another set, you simply increased by two again. Right. You didn't check another way of, of printing that rule. And even when I said no, that isn't my rule, you still stuck to it. So when the, and as Jerry pointed out, the easiest way to test if a rule is true is to see if you can find a contradiction. And in fact, that's the way science works. If you want to find out if something is correct, you try to falsify it. And that's what makes the, the, the heart of science. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> that's because we've known each other for several years now. Um, so perhaps some people are more immune to these effects than others. If a group exists, it has yet to be identified. One favorite candidate for such a group <coughs> are people that know about these effects. So an interesting study was done, in, uh, reported on in 2012, that looked at the blind spot, uh, blinds, the biased blind spot. This is the tendency for people to notice everyone else's bias, but not their own. No one can identify with that, right? They found that such a blind spot exists in basically all the biases that are known, and that Higher cognit cognit higher cognitive sophistication, such as cognitive ability or thinking dispositions related to bias, was associated with a larger blind spot. In other words, the smarter you are and the more you know about this stuff, the more likely you are to be fooled, in particular, by yourself. The zero-sum bias describes Intuitively judging a situation to be zero-sum when it is actually non-zero-sum. Experimental participants who were students at a university where the student grades were determined by how well their quality of work compared to a predetermined standard of quality rather than the quality of work produced by other students. This produces a non-zero-sum situation in which high grades have an un are an unlimited resource. In three experiments, Participants were shown the grade distribution after a majority of the students in a course had completed an assigned presentation and asked to predict the grade of the next presenter. When many grades had many high grades were already given, there was a corresponding increase in low grade predictions. This suggests a zero sum bias in which people perceive a, com a competition for the limited resource of high grades, even though the resource isn't limited. Interestingly, when many low grades were given, there was not a corresponding increase in high grade predictions. This suggests that the zero-sum heuristic is only applied in a response for the, for the allocation of desirable resources. So not only do we not think clearly, we don't even think clearly, in, think unclearly consistently. Why does this necessarily mean we're not thinking clearly? Because when you're told that the situation is a non-zero sum, but previous um, results 
change the way you are, what predictions you make, then you're just doing it wrong. But there are other biases involved, too. Oh, I didn't say there was always that bias. Yeah. There's just but one other. You want to give the answer that, I mean, there's a bias. I'm, 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 gonna, I'm just going to keep yeah, going. That, you know, so, you want to give the, the bias that the experimenter... The, the IKEA effect. <laughs> uh, Michael Norton, along with his colleagues, conducted an experiment based on a, the principal question whether consumers would pay a higher price for products that require self-assembly. <laughs> Subjects were given the task of finishing self-assembly IKEA furniture. The experiment examined whether subjects are willing to pay more for furniture that they assemble themselves, as opposed to pre-assembled furniture. Results showed that subjects were willing to pay 63% more for the stuff they made themselves. <coughs> Another experiment involved two sets of subjects. The first were told to completely assemble a piece of IKEA furniture. The second set were instructed to assemble a piece of IKEA furniture, but only partially. Both groups then took part in a bidding over these objects. Results showed that individuals who had built the boxes completely were willing to pay more than the individuals that had only partly finished. Like you'll buy things that are in the front of the store. Well, there's lots of biases. One of my favorite ones is the fact that people are, think that things are, are better if they cost more. Or if they're marked down more. Well, there's a whole, there's a store, a needless markup. That, you know, that, anyway, um, at this point, I think, or more accurately, feel that it is safe to conclude that everyone makes mistakes, and lots of them. Since these errors are committed outside of our conscious attention, we are often unaware that they have happened. And they can be very hard to detect. And if you can't detect them, how in the world can you correct them? The net effect of these biases and resulting illusions is that many of the things thought to be true by many people aren't. All of us have know of lots of examples. People believe in Bigfoot, angels, mental telepathy, ghosts, the list seems endless, and they don't believe in things that are true. Vaccines eliminate far more harm than they cause. Human action is causing our climate to change. Cell phones don't cause brain cancer. We did send people to the moon. Biological evolution through natural selection does account for the diversity of life on our planet, and apparently some people don't think the world is round. Still don't know if those are, these people are just pulling our collective legs or not. I hope so. So what do we do about this? Often the answer given is education. And I'll, I'm all for that. One of the founders of the modern scientific skepticism movement, Carl Sagan, said, we live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology, in which hardly anyone knows anything about science and technology. This is a clear prescription for disaster. But I think that answer is too broad. As we've seen, education isn't always enough. It needs to be education about specific things. And as I hope I've made clear, one of those things is the subject of cognitive illusions. At its heart, this is what skepticism is all about. As skeptics, our response is to educate and elucidate both the actual information and the ways in which the information, incorrect information, could have gotten into our heads in the first place. It is the pervasive nature of these problems that make it so important and so difficult to tackle. This is the reason that skepticism is important. We need to get it right more often than we do. In a more complex world, we need to get it more off, right more often than we did in the past. I think one of the best ways to get it right more often is to understand why we are likely to get it wrong. I suspect that there's nothing we can do to change the rate at which our snap judgments are correct, namely low. But we can cultivate a reflexive cognitive double take, or as George Robb has put it, treat every day as if it is April Fool's Day. <laughs> no doubt this is not a surprise to anyone in this room. And some of us have claimed, as Ben mentioned, that people with these mistaken beliefs must be stupid. Usually the response is something like, no, they're not stupid, they're simply mistaken. Depending on your definition of stupid, 
Yeah, they are, but then again, so are all of us at that definition. But they're mistaken. And that should be recognized, and that it's not at all surprising. Given how many ways there are for us to come to the wrong conclusion, it's remarkable that we have advanced at all, never mind as far as we have. We need to keep this in mind when we interact with other people. We need to remember that we are, quite likely, wrong in whatever we're about to say. <laughs> and you have to decide whether that was true with the previous sentence. <laughs> in fact, I'm surprised that the backspace key on my keyboard hasn't worn out. Thank you. Um, you could say that, yeah. but it would be contradicted by all the evidence I gave. <laughs> I gave lots of I gave lots of evidence to support my my view. Um, but I think that I think that that could be true. You have a bias. No, uh, uh, it could be, but it would be wrong to do so because I gave evidence. <laughs> so, okay. The second is. Are there, you know, situations in which that's not always a bad thing, such as in, you know, the placebo effect. Um, the placebo effect is not always a bad thing. And yeah. then again, neither is yeah. anything else. I mean, there are reasons we have double-blind studies, for instance. When we, right, and right. none of them have to do with the placebo effect being a good thing. Not, not <coughs> that's a separate, but when people believe that something is effective, even if it isn't necessarily effective, um, the placebo effect was one of the things on that slide that I showed. Yeah, but the placebo, there, even if there's no scientific evidence that something works, if you believe that something works, and then it works then that is a, a that, way, that, that, that is a bias that gets you to come to an incorrect conclusion. But it, maybe not, to, but if the outcome is good. If the outcome is I don't want to go to the doctor because I can take care of this with by thinking nicely about it. But you get um, better. Except, did, did you watch the, the, the Mitchell and Webb video that was shown earlier this morning? Um, for the, the great, for, for all of the really horrible things that happened, um, these woo-woo uh, approaches don't work really well. But for, pe but for people that come in with a general sense of malaise, it works great. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's the questions can go and come talk to you again. I thought we'd have a lot more more confusion with the other uh, the other lectures, not not with Leonard.